So let's talk about why you'd want to build a distributed system. So I'm going to do this top 10 style and list backwards to forwards the 10 reasons why you might want to build your own distributed system, starting from perhaps the worst reason and working your way up to the best reasons. Reason number 10, your boss told you to. Now, this may not be a terrible reason to build a distributed system. You get to keep your job. But before you go and design and build a system based on this reason, you should really understand why your boss wants you to do this. Why? Because one, your boss might be wrong, and it's best to understand that before you spend a lot of work on designing and building a complicated, hairy infrastructure and machine. And also, if you don't really understand why this is the right solution to the problem, you might design and build the wrong solution. So I'm going to categorize this as the worst reason to have, if it's the only reason you have for building your distributed system. Reason number nine, it's fun. You've just been watching these videos. You think distributed systems are really cool. And why not apply them to your job? Well, if it's your hobby and you're doing it for fun, I can't argue against doing it for fun. But if what you're trying to do is design a real system that people will use, you want to build the best possible solution. And so this alone, once again, is not a good reason for building a distributed system. Hopefully you can come up with some better excuses. I mean, uh, reasons for building it. Reason number eight, you need a server anyways. What do I mean by this? Well, you might be solving a problem which can't be solved with a single machine. For example, um, you, you need a client server architecture. You've got a customer database that has sensitive information. You need that to be in a server which you can secure and lock down. And then you have your customers that are running a client on their end user machines. And you don't want to ship the entire customer database out to every customer's machine because that would be a security nightmare. Okay, so that means you need a client server architecture. It doesn't necessarily mean you need your server to be a distributed system. There are other cases like this as well. Um, you have mobile devices that run a client, and then you have a server that contains the shared state. And the mobile devices have limited battery life, so you don't want to do all the computation on the mobile devices. If you're doing voice recognition, often voice recognition is partitioned between the client, which gathers the voice data, and then the server that does the heavy-duty processing. Um, or maybe your application fundamentally involves sharing of information. If you're writing a web bulletin board system or a chat system, it just doesn't work unless there's information shared between the various users because it's just not a chat application if you can only talk to yourself. Sort of like what I'm doing right now with this camera. Anyways, that's just an aside. Um, so, you may need a client server architecture and that may involve applying some of the techniques you learn for designing distributed systems but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to fully distribute your state amongst all of the machines involved in the calculation. Okay, so let's move on to the next reason. You might have legal reasons or privacy reasons or political reasons for building a distributed system. This really gets out of the domain of the technical and into the policy question. Um, an example of this is the Tor network. The Tor network is a distributed system. It is not a distributed system because it's more efficient to have all your network packets flying around, bouncing back and forth between various end user machines. It is simply done this way because you can preserve, or at least make it harder, for someone to invade a user's privacy and discover where network flows are coming from. Uh, similarly with um, music file sharing services, GrooveShark or Napster were examples of distributed systems that existed primarily to make it so that we could preserve the um, the legal fiction that, uh, that uh, the company providing the service wasn't violating any laws. Okay, maybe it wasn't, I'm not going to get into a debate as to whether it was a fiction or not, but it, it, it was a legal reason for designing the system in that way. Reason number six, you want to align the cost incentives of your users with you. What do I mean by this? Well, you might be providing a service that is a very expensive for you to provide because it would require you to do a lot of computation. Wouldn't it be better if the benefit your users get um, is proportional to what they pay? 
And they may not want to pay money. They can pay by providing their computer to run part of the service for on your behalf. Um, and so you might want to distribute the computation. As, for example, SETI at home would be an example of this, where uh, you have all the users and they provide computers that do part of your computation for you. And you don't go bankrupt as someone who creates the SETI at home program. Okay. Reason number five, uptime requirements. And by this I mean the various pieces of your system don't have the same reliability requirements. Part of your system might need to be very, very reliable. And so you're willing to spend a lot of engineering effort on it and perhaps buy a lot of hardware to run that reliable small component of your system. And then there might be some window decorations, some other pieces of your system, which are much less important that they're reliable. They can be a little bit flaky. And so you want to run them on cheaper hardware or with less redundancy. And so if you distribute your system over those multiple components, you can then distribute them over different costs or classes of hardware and save yourself some money. Okay. Reason number four, performance. And what I mean here is the latency and bandwidth to your end users. If you have your server sitting in New York and then you get a large number of customers in China, they'll be unhappy customers because of the network round trip latency going all the way around the planet to reach your server. So maybe you have customers in New York and China and so you want servers in New York and in China. Okay, that solves the problem, but now you have your state partitioned between New York and China. You've got a distributed system. Congratulations. An example of this would be a content delivery network like Akamai, which makes it so that there's a web cache in almost every major ISP and sometimes more than one in the ISP if the ISP has a lot of um, reach to various geographies, um, that caches the data such that, it's all, that large blobs of data are always close to the users that want them, so that when the user requests the data, it's nice and fast getting their data back. And this actually makes a lot of the World Wide Web as we know it a lot faster than it would be otherwise if it was served out of centralized data centers. Reason number three. You're building only part of the system. You rely on someone else, a cloud service provider or vendor, that is providing an online service that does part of your computation. You might be a customer of Amazon and be relying on Amazon storage. Or you might be a customer of Google's cloud and relying on Google's big table service or some, something like that. Um, so if you have a dependency on a cloud vendor and your system was already has its state partitioned between that vendor and your system, you've already built a distributed system. So at that point, you should start thinking, are there other ways which I can also take advantage of this and use distributed systems techniques to make my system work better? And you might conclude the answer is no, but you should at least be thinking about it Especially, at least so that you can understand how to debug the interactions between what you've written and your vendor system. Reason number two, the second best reason for building a distributed system, okay, maybe this prioritization isn't absolute, is reliability. A single server, a single computer, can only be made so reliable at a sane cost. And even at infinite cost, there's only a, a fixed amount of reliability that you can get out of a single server. Because it just costs too much to make sure that you have enough redundant hardware and that your CPU never fails and that there's a, never a tornado where you happen to have put your server and that yeah, there's just Murphy's Law always tends to win. But what if you need more reliability? If you can distribute your system over more than one computer in more than one physical location with the appropriate load balancing, the appropriate failover, the appropriate operational support, you can build a system that is much more reliable than what a single com computer can provide. And that is, I think, is a great reason, if you need it and are willing to pay the cost, for building a distributed system. And then reason number one, the one that most people use to justify their decision to build a distributed system, rightfully or not, is scale. A single computer can only do so much work. We haven't figured out how to scale a single computer up infinitely. At least, we do have actually some techniques for making computers scale and have more and more CPUs, but their performance goes down and they cost more and more the more you scale them. And so if you can distribute your system over more than one computer, you can often get the same amount of computation done faster and more cheaply. 
Who's going to argue with that? Well, the argument against is that there's a lot of engineering effort involved in making your system distributed in the first place. And often projections of how much scale you need uh, are wrong. There, there, there's no, no other way of saying it other than people are often very optimistic about how many customers they're going to get for their system. And so that means that they put a lot of engineering effort into building a scalable solution when a centralized solution would have been good enough. So scalability can be a great reason for building a distributed system if you have confidence in your projections of user growth and so on. And one thing to keep in mind is that Moore's law is really powerful. Computers are getting faster all the time. So it might be that computers get faster than your workload on your system grows. So that might work out to your advantage and save you a lot of effort, but you should look into it. So there you go. That's a summary of why you should build a distributed system. You should always know your reasons for building it before you start your design. Or maybe you discover them as you work on your design. But you want to make sure that the design you come up with actually addresses your reasons for building a distributed system. Otherwise, you might do a lot of work for nothing and have to throw it away and start over. So that's it. Thank you so much, and please go on to my next video.